United, Ireland free, Ireland self-supporting and self-reliant, Ireland speaking her own tongue and through it giving to the world our ancient treasures of Christian Gaelic culture. These are the ideals to which enthusiastic young Ireland is now devoting its energy. He was the spearhead of one of the greatest nationalist movements of the 20th century. Though he was born an American, he led the people of Ireland in their violent struggle for independence. His name is Eamon de Valera, and this is his biography. Wallace, this is Biography. Our story, Eamon de Valera. In the early 1880s, an artist from Spain named Vivion de Valera settled in New York City and married Catherine Call. He died in 1884, and his widow decided to return to her native Ireland with her two-year-old son, Edward. Growing up in County Limerick, Edward changed his name to the Gaelic, Eamon. Though an American citizen, he identified himself only with Ireland. As he once said, whenever I want to know what the Irish people are thinking, I look into my own heart. Ireland, wrote poet William Butler Yeats, is a land of heart's desire where beauty has no ebb, decay no flood. But joy is wisdom, time an endless song. For centuries, the Irish people seemed bound to the past. They were content to celebrate the rugged beauty of their country in lilting songs and ancient Gaelic ballads. the king, but Ireland. Easter Monday, 1916. Open rebellion rocks the city of Dublin, seat of the English government in Ireland. The British War Ministry orders the Easter uprising crushed, 
and English gunboats opened fire on Dublin. the insurgents refused to give up their fight. Writes a poet of the revolution, all changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Within a week, however, the Easter Rebellion is over. The last rebel officer to surrender is Eamon de Valera. Now he voices his bitter disappointment. If only the people had risen en masse, he says. If they had gone out with nothing but knives and forks in their hands, they could have won the country. Instead of being hailed, the rebels are branded by their own countrymen as irresponsible radicals who have caused the destruction of Dublin. English war courts will try the leaders of the Easter Rebellion. Eamon de Valera escapes execution. Because of his American citizenship, his sentence is commuted to a life term in prison. Sixteen of the rebel leaders, however, will die before a firing squad. And from the plain of Royal Meat, strong men came hurrying through, while Britannia's sons with their long range guns. The The bravest bell and the solemn bell rang mournfully and clear. For those who died at Easter tide in the springing of the year. But had they died by Pierce's side or fought with Valera true? Graves we keep where the pinions sleep Need the hills of the foggy Executions outrage the Irish people and succeed in accomplishing what the rebel leaders themselves had failed to do. The spark of nationalist spirit is finally ignited. And the world is gazing deep amazed at those fearless men and true who bore the fight that blew them In an effort to stem the sudden rise of Irish patriotism, England proclaims a general amnesty for rebel prisoners. Hardly known less than a year before, Eamon de Valera has become leader of the Irish rebels. In Dublin, thousands hail the men of the Easter Rebellion as heroes of Ireland. spokesman for a nationalist political party called Sinn Féin, Gaelic for We Ourselves, de Valera travels throughout Ireland, stirring support for the cause of independence. The Sinn Féin movement sweeps to victory in an Irish election. But instead of taking parliamentary seats in England, the majority chooses to sit in Dublin at their own Dáil Éireann, the Assembly of Ireland. Once again, they proclaim the Republic with Eamon de Valera as its leader. June 1919. Eamon de Valera begins an American tour in search of support for the revolution. His mission, he says, is to gain funds and recognition for an independent Ireland. In cities like New York and Chicago, he is greeted by throngs of sympathetic Irish immigrants. Men who have become railroad builders, factory workers, politicians, and policemen. De Valera looks more like a schoolmaster than the hero of a revolution. But he strikes home when he talks about the Ireland they were forced to leave. They rally to this man they call Dev, the tall fella from Ireland. Though he raises millions of dollars, Washington refuses official recognition of De Valera or his Republic of Ireland. Physically exhausted, the leader of Irish nationalism ends his American tour late in 1920 to return to a country torn with bitter conflict. An 
declared guerrilla war is being waged by Irish nationalists against British military garrisons in Ireland. Specially picked British police embark for Southern Ireland. The Irish will call them the Black and Tan, a name taken from a famous pack of foxhounds. The Black and Tan set up cordons and roadblocks and search Irish civilians for hidden weapons. De Valera openly calls them English invaders and charges that they are waging an unjust and barbarous war. Finally, in desperation, British authorities order that all Irishmen found carrying weapons face a sentence of death by firing squad. The executions incite mass protests, public mornings, hunger strikes and street riots. The situation reaches the brink of total war between Ireland and Great Britain. London streets as De Valera arrives for truce talks with England's Prime Minister Lloyd George. The British attempt to make peace by offering limited independence with King George as head of state. De Valera, however, insists that the Irish people have a moral right to be free, and he stubbornly holds out for complete political detachment from the British crown. Says Lloyd George, Negotiating with that Irishman is like trying to scoop up mercury with a fork. Tension mounts throughout the summer and fall of 1921. Irish Republican Army units are training for a possible all-out clash with British forces. Eamon de Valera realizes that acceptance of Britain's terms would sacrifice every aim of the revolution. But continued resistance, he knows, can lead only to a war that will ravage the land and leave in its wake a totally crippled Ireland. Eamon de Valera refuses to continue face-to-face -face negotiations with Lloyd George and returns to Dublin. In his absence, Irish delegates hoping to save Ireland from war have yielded to Lloyd George. Without de Valera's consent, they have accepted Britain's terms and have signed a treaty endorsing a divided Ireland. The South will become the new Irish Free State with limited self-rule, and the North will remain under British control. Says de Valera, I am against this treaty, and he vows to continue fighting for a united and independent Ireland. The controversy surrounding the treaty splits the nation into two camps. Large segments of the Irish army turn their backs on the new legal government and rally to Eamon de Valera. The threat of a bloody civil war is born throughout southern Ireland. De Valera's army leaders have turned Dublin's Four Courts building into staff headquarters. When they refuse to leave, Irish government soldiers open fire on the building. The siege lasts only a few days, but it is enough to ignite a civil war. Throughout Ireland, brother fights brother. William Butler Yeats, the blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. In Cork, in Limerick, Kilkenny and Kildare, in Dublin, in Carlow and Tipperary, the war impoverishes, embitters, and finally exhausts the nation. and heartbroken, De Valera bitterly tells his men, you have saved the nation's honor and kept open the road to independence. In 1921, 
1927, de Valera launches a renewed fight for independence. But it is now a political battle, and in order to defeat a conservative majority in the Irish government, he must have campaign funds. Once again, he looks to the United States for help. Eamon de Valera is greeted in New York City with the same enthusiasm as a decade before. For Americans, he remains the hero of the Irish Rebellion. I know that all our friends in the United States, the friends of Ireland, will rejoice with us that we have seen this day, and that as in the past, they will sustain us with their aid and attend our efforts with their thoughts and prayers. Dublin, the early 1930s. De Valera is fighting a pitched battle with William Cosgrave's free state government. He promises that his new party, Fianna Fáil, Gaelic for Soldiers of Destiny, will move forward toward total independence. This election then will complete the execution of the one of the first promise that we made and make it possible in the future for the Irish people peacefully to determine what is to be the national policy. Throngs of inspired Irishmen pack Dublin's College Green as fiery orators echo the spirit of the Irish rebellion. What are you lads of the IRA going to do? Do you want one army in Ireland? I answer that question as one individual, and I say, yes, one army, one army pledged for an Irish Republic. And Cosgrave's gang has tried that all these 10 years. Every avenue for Republicans was closed, barred by an oath. Ireland, Republican Ireland stands united. United for the Republic that our men have sacrificed so much for and that so many of our men have died for. And please God, we will stand together at the end and triumph and win that Republic. On election day, Eamon de Valera, hero of the 1916 Easter Uprising, an outspoken champion of independence, comes head of the Irish Free State, a nation still partially controlled by England. During the 1930s, de Valera forces Great Britain to make concessions leading toward a completely free nation. In his own country, he tries to revive Irish nationalism. He urges that ancient Gaelic be adopted as the national tongue. English, he says, is the language of the conqueror and the badge of a slave. Many Irishmen, however, prefer the tempo of life traditional to Ireland. The poets write, we are the music makers and the dreamers of dreams. Says one Irish author, in a word, we are an antique people. British Northern Ireland for training and full-scale maneuvers. World War II has begun, and England is engaged in a desperate conflict with Nazi Germany. Southern Ireland, however, now the sovereign state of era, refuses to become involved in Britain's problem. Throughout the war years, de Valera is a target for criticism by the Allies. He is often termed a villain wrapped in a cloak of neutrality, Rumors of unchecked Axis activity in Ireland bring blistering charges and demands from the United States and Great Britain. De Valera vehemently denies the rumors and warns the Allies to stay out of Ireland's affairs. Says De Valera, if war comes, we will defend ourselves, and whoever comes first will be our enemy. Though thousands of Irishmen volunteer to fight alongside the Allies, the state of era maintains neutrality as a rigid national policy. April 1941. 
1849. The last ties with England are broken. On the 33rd anniversary of the Easter Rebellion, Dublin celebrates the birth of an independent Irish Republic. Ancient Ireland is a nation on its own. Eamon de Valera, however, it is not the victory he had always envisioned. Six northern counties in the old province of Ulster are still ruled by the United Kingdom. Irish elections in the 1950s turned to economic issues. De Valera finds himself defeated at the polls, largely over a controversy arising from the cost of a pint of stout. Writes one reporter, to the Irishman the pint is comfort. And comfort means more to him than national politics. Late in the 1950s, it becomes evident that Irish nationalism has not died. Once again, anti-British activities flare into the open. Die-hard leaders of the outlawed Irish Republican Army engage in hit-and-run attacks along the border of British-held Ireland. Prime Minister de Valera, however, sobered by years of internal strife, orders border raids suppressed and IRA leaders jailed. He tells Irishmen that another hateful civil war would utterly destroy their nation. Now, it would seem apparent that Eamon de Valera may not, in his lifetime, realize his dream of a free and united nation. Ireland, however, is at last finding a place for itself in the 20th century. A rise of native industries and modern industrialization have put the country on the threshold of a new era. In 1959, at the age of 77, Eamon de Valera is elected president of Ireland. He enters the presidential mansion in Dublin's quiet Phoenix Park to take an office which he himself acknowledges to be above politics. For almost half a century, through conflict, imprisonment, failure and success, he has served Ireland as soldier and statesman. Now, says Eamon de Valera, they have put me in the park. A strange, almost religious force constantly drove Eamon de Valera. A leading journalist once wrote, De Valera is a man who through all his mature years had but one purpose to achieve liberation of his country, cost him what it might, and sometimes, it would seem, cost his country what it might. Today, largely through de Valera's efforts, the Republic of Ireland is a proud and democratic nation. Mike Wallace for Biography. Thank <laughs> you.